Hello and welcome to another episode of Bare Bones Wargaming, a show with no bells, no whistles, no frills, just a man, a camera, and his game. Today, on this episode, as you can see, I have the European Turmoil map here. That's because, after some thought and reflection, I've decided to do the BBW, Bare Bones Wargaming Opinion Time, and you know what that means. The good, the bad, and the ugly. All right. So, again, this is Europe in Turmoil, Prelude to the Great War, by Compass Games, designed by Chris Van Bergen. Okay. So let's talk about this game. Well, let's first start with this. Let me show you my lists. Here's my lists. So, spoiler alert. Again, green's good, black is bad, and the red is the ugly. So, as you can see, there is a lot of green. So let's get to it. Okay. Now, keep in mind, this is my review after three full plays of this, all solo by three different solo methods. Method one was the two-card method, which if you want, you can check my video out on that. Method two was the Stuka Joe method, where I had one side controlled by his CDG method, and then I controlled the other side. And then the third method was using Stuka Joe's CDG method to solo CDG method to control both sides uh, uh, in the game. All right, so here we go. First of all, the good. Love the tension. This thing is super, super tense. Um, it is interesting, the whole scoring versus, of course, then you've got to keep an eye on what's going up here on the Great War track. Okay, how's the tension rising? You know, dun, 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 the pressure, so to speak. Um, that is, that makes the game very tense. You really are sweating, you know, each decision and each turn. And you've got the naval race to worry about, too, because the naval race boxes actually in this game are very uh, strong for lack of a better way to put it. There really is an incentive for you to get ahead on that track, and they do have an impact on the game. I would agree, some other people have commented, that it is much more significant than the space race and Twilight Struggle, and I would say times two, at least times two on that, because the naval race in this can really, you know, it triggers off certain cards and things like that. Um, it's really well done. I like how this was put into this, okay? Which leads me to my second point, the interplay of things here, okay? Because not only do you got to keep an eye on the tension track there, but you got to keep an eye on the scoring regions. You also have to keep an eye on this aspect of the game, down here in this lower corner. You have to keep an eye on the socioeconomic icons, okay? Because so many of the cards are tied into, you know, worker spaces or, you know, um the church spaces and things like that it's um it's it's really a lot of interplay you also have to watch out for these independent spaces and these permanent spaces like great britain uh yeah it's it's really it's very interesting to me how it all kind of hooks together and meshes together almost like a tapestry if you will uh, of all this um of all these maneuverings and stuff it really does feel like uh how the political maneuvering and all the stuff that was going on, the crises and things, it really has that feel to it. And I love the fact that it has that feel to it. So, so that's another cool thing I like about it. Another good thing is the, how the Great War is represented. I love the fact that the Great War can break out and then you resolve it. And you can resolve it either using these mobilization cards, which I've done a number of times, Okay, which is a blast. It has been very interesting. Or you can do it by the regular rules. The cards are an option. And you can do, um, well, quite frankly, a bunch of die rolling. Which I actually prefer the mobilization cards. This is my preference. But the point is that you can play it either way, however you'd like to play it. And I think that's really cool. And just, you know, the fact that it can happen. You know, this just isn't about all the stuff that was going on prior to the war. And then it's a very slick system that, re that resolves it. And then you score all the regions at the very end. Okay, um, options. There's a lot of options here. 
Okay, uh, there's a lot of things between the play of the cards, the stability cards that are used. Whenever you score a region, you got to do the stability checks, do a crisis check. There's just so many things, which leads to another good point. The replay value of this is ridiculously high. The sequencing of events, how things can come out, whether you choose to play an event or not, whether you choose to put an event on your opponent. For example, the Franz Ferdinand card, which is an authoritarian card. You know, as authoritarians, if you're kicking butt, you might want to ratchet up the tension and be like, dude, it's on, like Donkey Kong. But then, you know, if you're the liberal player, you might be like, aha, I'll go ahead and play this and trigger this bad boy off to keep the tension level you know, down at three, if he controls, you know, Vienna and Budapest, he can't go above three. Aha! You know, it's it's interesting how that is. You know, like, man, I need more time. I need more time. You know, so there's a lot of replay here, okay? Uh, the, the naval race chart, the mobilization cars, there's several for each country. I think the fewest is three for Austria-Hungary, which makes sense because they really didn't have a lot of options for them. But most of the other countries have at least five cards that you can use. Okay, the die rolling when you resolve the Great War. Um, it's just ridiculous how much the replay is. I mentioned the naval rewards already. That's also on my list over here. Which, I again, I really liked how important the naval race is. You really got to pay attention to it. You can't afford to fall too far behind. Okay, uh, I like the icons too. I like the fact that each space has one or two icons which influence things, you know, which you can basically be looking at here. Um, you know, like this space in Serbia is both an annex space and a military space. So, you know, depending on your cards and your events, which you can play things in, you know, and, and the cards actually, there's quite a few cards that allow you to kind of stick it to your opponent and get back into areas that they control, which uh, I also, you know, really like too. Um, this is very solo friendly. Like I said, I've played it three times now with three different methods and I had fun every time. Now granted, I will say that the solo method I did with me actively playing one side and the CD, Stuka Joe's CDG method taking the other, that was a little unbalanced. But I mean, that's to be expected. But, you know, it could have been unbalanced the other way too. Uh, I do that basically because to me that feels a little more like playing a real person. That's just my personal opinion. Uh, of course, the downside of that is you, you know, kind of see what some of their cards are. But on the other hand, you could argue that, you know, when you're playing against somebody, if you've got somebody who's not a very good poker player, and they're like burning a hole <laughs> into France, you'd be like, dude, they got the French scoring card. I know they do. You know, they could be bluffing, too, if they're a really good poker player. But my point being that, you know, there's little tips and things that you can see from what's happening and stuff, unless somebody's really doing a good job being very Bismarckian or Machiavellian, if you will. That, again, doesn't completely, to me, doesn't unbalance it when you play it, okay? It's just a different style. It's a different experience, okay? Another really good thing is the rules are clear on this. Uh, I've had only a few questions, and my biggest question was about the Franz Ferdinand cards so far. Um, but, you know, the rules are laid out well. There's color. Uh, there's a nice big example at the back that has, um, you know, Hold on, let me get to the page. There we go. But it's nice to lay it out. I played through this and actually set up the map and did it and stuff, which I recommend, by the way, because reading it, you don't get the full effect of how it works. So, so I really like, you know, I really like that as well, too. And I do like the extra layer of the stability uh, cards when you score a region, because, again, that plus the crisis rules can really throw things off. You know, if you're trying to play a scoring card because you're like, yes, I can pick up, you know, six points or seven points in Russia. But you also got to look at the tension track because you're like, ooh, the tension track is on four and the Great War status track is all the way over to zero. Yikes. You know, I play the scoring card. This could be it. How am I standing in the rest of the year? So you really do have to kind of uh, look at that. And I really, really enjoy that as well, too. Uh, I also like the fact that the support checks, which are similar to coup attempts in Twilight Struggle, that you can't go above the number that um, is in the space, printed space. So, for example, here in Croatia, uh, this three, you know, sometimes like in Twilight Struggle, if you get a really good die roll and somebody has like two and you end up with a value of like ten, you can put eight points in here. You can't do that here. The most you can do is put enough in for control. Now, you can put them in via ops. You could build up your side, you know, liberal or authoritarian, to like a six or a seven be like, dude, I so want Croatia. But you can't do that with support checks. So I like that. So in other words, if you're going to build it up with ops, 
that means you're taking away from other things. So you better be very sure that you really want that ball work there. Or you really want that space because um, you're going to pay for it elsewhere if you do it with ops. So I also like that too. Now, the bad. Okay, a couple of bad things here. First of all, speaking of support checks, the support checks really can swing things. Okay, especially on some of these spaces like Budapest. Um, it's another good one. Actually, Budapest is one of the lowest because it only has a value of two. But, you know, certain other spaces too, even with a value of three, it, it can really swing things. You get to do two support checks with every single card. So if you have like a four ops card, and you do like say Vienna and Nicholas II, next thing you know, you just took two battlegrounds away from your opponent, and if they can't get back into those, and you've got one of the scoring cards, bam! So that does make things a little um, swingy. But, you know, um, I mention it because, again, some of the bad things, quote unquote, I mentioned, is things just to make people aware of. You know, if you're thinking about buying the game, is this game for me? To me, I don't mind it so much because, again, politics, so weird things happen. You know, it's like um, Henry Kissinger's book Diplomacy, where he speculates about, you know, Franz Ferdinand and, you know, how Franz Joseph viewed him. And if that had been like a super state funeral and all the heads of Europe had showed up at it, you know, what if they had all got together and chatted? You know, would things have gotten as out of hand as they did? Maybe, maybe not. Who knows? I mean, you know, there's other articles. Um, oh, oh, I forget the journal now. But some years ago I read one. Um, yeah. Uh, International Relations Journal, maybe? I can't remember. But anyway, it was basically about how Germany was bent on, you know, an expansive war. They thought this was their best moment. Although why they didn't go in 1905? Eh, anyway, so... You know, it's um, it basically my point being that politics can swing a lot. No one expected the, the Nazi Soviet pact. You know, uh, nobody really was expecting Pearl Harbor. So, you know, it's... I don't mind it as much, but some people might. Let's put it that way. Another thing is sometimes events chain. I have one events chain. What I mean by that is if you get rolling, like if you manage to draw a bunch of liberal events that fit together... You know, synchronicity rears its head. You can basically start to steamroll stuff. Some of the events are very powerful. You know, um, diagonal, the one di card that has diagonal in the title. I can't remember the rest of the title. But, you know, the uh, government-sponsored art for the authoritarians lets you put one strength point in every intellectual space except for Bosnia and Siberia. That can be huge. So you string together a bunch of those. Like, if you string that together with turpets, where you suddenly get rolling on the naval track and stuff... You know, that can, the game can, can very quickly start to chug, chug, chug toward the other side. And then you really got to watch the tension track. Because if one side gets ahead with a bunch of events like that, you know, they're going to wrap it up, ratchet up the tension. And that's it, man. It's on and you're going to be, you know, stick a fork in you. You're done kind of thing. Okay. Um, some of the cards at the very bottom, the print is kind of very tiny. I know most of that print is just about putting these reminder markers here and on spaces in the map here like Bosnia. But it is really tiny. So until you learn the cards, like by heart, so to speak, that can be a little bit of a bad thing, too. The other thing is that um, with some of the liberal cards, it does feel like the game has a bit of a liberal tint. Now, granted, you know, the way the history played out, obviously, with what happened, you know, um, World War I was just socio political, socio social, economically, it was just a game changer. You know, by the time the war is over, you know, you have three empires completely wiped away. You know, Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Russia gone from the face of the earth. You have another one, Britain, just basically, let's face it, now you can look back at history and say it was critically injured. You know, it was like in the ICU after the First World War. So, um, so I, I think it's appropriate, but sometimes it does feel like some of the liberal cards especially if they start rolling or you're the authoritarian player and you get stuck with a bunch of them, which the event is triggered off by the, you know, triggered off when you play it, unless you, there is one cancellation card, the eight league nation, or you dump it into the naval race, but you can only dump once per turn. That, that can really, you know, that can feel like being, you know, run over by, you know, like having Jim Brown run you over, you know, in a football game or Herschel Walker, actually. Herschel Walker is a good example too. That'd be like being run over by Herschel Walker. If you ever seen him play, my God, um, he just, you know, he'd kill you. So, that's one thing too. I just I do think it's tilted a little bit that way. That's just my personal opinion after three plays. Maybe that'll change, but I do that's my gut feeling on this. 
as far as that goes. As for the ugly, um, well, 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 in the immortal words of James Brown, well, 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 or perhaps Eddie Murphy pretending to be James Brown, maybe I'm thinking to Saturday Night Live skit. The only thing I really find ugly about this game is the map. And I mean the map not so much in the sense of, you know, how it's all set up and stuff. Um, I mean, it, I mean, could it use a little pizzazz, a little, you know, ba bam, you know, maybe. Eh, you could argue that and debate that. Uh, but what I will say is this. This game is going to retail for $79 soon. And the fact that the counters, most of them, are just, you know, the strength point counters. You know, you got the, the monarch symbol and the, the star symbol for the liberals. Um, I, I mean, the map is just... Right here, let me just show you. It's just a map sheet. Look at that. Hear that? It's just a map sheet. So, I mean, I, I pre-ordered it, so it was 55 so I don't feel quite as bad, because that's like a $25 difference. But if I was paying $79 for this, I would at least expect that map to be like heavy cards, the heavy card stock stuff, you know, like, um, um, oh, what am I thinking of? I can see it, but I can't, which game am I thinking of? Is it Triumph and Tragedy? It might be Triumph and Tragedy that has the thicker, but anyway, one of those games that has like the thicker card stock maps to them. That's what I kind of expected. Uh, for this map, and that is a little disappointing for the price tag. I have to be honest. Now, I know there's a lot of cards in this, which I know, you know, cards are not cheap, but again, the fact that the counters are very simple, yeah, yeah I just, yeah, I'm, just, I'm a little disappointed in the map in that, in that sense, so, um, yeah. So, but other things like uh, about the map I do like. I mean, it's easy to pick out the battleground spaces. Uh, the lines are a little bit hard to see sometimes, except the external ones going to independent country. That's you know, blatantly clear. Um, but, you know, overall, most of the icons are pretty nice and clear. Now, granted, the annex ones, if you look over here, let me show you Alsace Lorraine close up. You know, I, you know, I mean, if you didn't know your history, you um, you might miss the fact that Alsace Lorraine is an annex space. Okay, if you look at that there, because see those cross swords, that's kind of very faint. Uh, there, the hammer is very clear. That's clearly a worker space. So there is that as well, um, too. So so overall, uh, this game I would say I really enjoyed. This is the first World War One era game that I had truly had fun with in a long time. World War One is one of those eras that really just um, doesn't interest me. You know, quite frankly, for those of you who've seen Blackout or Goes Forth, if you remember that scene where, um, oh, the guy that, the man, the actor that played the guy in This Time Goes By, uh, the British comedy, I forget what his name is, but he plays, um, <laughs> now I've forgotten, the British commander. Um, ah, that's annoying. Tells you I haven't read much about World War One in a long time either. Uh, Haig, Haig, Haig. When there's that scene where Black Adder calls him, and he basically has a map in front of him with a bunch of, like, plastic soldiers on, and he just takes a little dustpan and broom and brushes a bunch of the soldiers in. I mean, that, to me, that just epitomizes, in my opinion, what World War One was like, especially on the Western Front. So, um... Yeah, I just, wow. Um, yeah. So anyway, so World War One is not usually one of my favorite topics as far as interest goes. But this, this does such a nice job with all the events and all the things happening that built up to it. And then has a very clean, simple, clever way to incorporate the war into the game that I really enjoy it. Um, and, the, and the game also, speaking of one other thing I forgot to mention with replayability... Is that, you know, in this game, Russia can be on the central power side. It is possible. If you, you know, as an authoritarian player, if you can hold on to that, you know, somehow keep the Franco-Russian alliance and the Entente Cordial from being played, you could keep Russia on your side. Or, if you get to the Georgian area at the end of the game, Russia could collapse and be completely out of the war at all. Not even participate. So, that 
I also like as well too, you know, the fact that there's you know some options here. There's flexibility here. It doesn't necessarily play out as history intended. Chances are it probably will. But not entirely. In my last game, um, Italy, I was able to get to play the Triple Alliance right before the war broke out, and Italy was on the side of the central part. Now, unfortunately, it didn't help because I just didn't do a good job with the authoritarians, but I also had tons of liberal cards. Um, Stuka Joe's method, as you've seen, has like five cards on each side, and it just completely, almost every, for like about four turns in a row, I had nothing but blue cards there. Now, granted, the liberal side had a fair amount of authoritarian cards, too, as a result. But, yeah, it's just... But, again, that goes back to my feeling that the liberal was a little stronger because the authoritarian cards, the liberal was able to manage better, in my opinion, the liberal half of me, as opposed to the authoritarian half. It was really hard to minimize the impact of those liberal cards. So, in the end, overall, when I'm looking at my list here, I have one ugly thing, two, four... Uh, bad things, and two, four, six, eight, ten. I've got ten good things. So overall, clearly, as you can tell from what I've talked about here, I really do enjoy this game. Uh, I have a lot of fun with it. It will be coming out again. Uh, right now, it's, and I own Twilight Struggle in 1989. This is my favorite of the three right now at the moment. Um, it is just a blast. So, if you're interested in this, and I would pick it up soon, especially if you're like a mountain map board fanatic, you're like, where's my mountain map board? You know, um, you, know you end up like one of those bad 1980s movies where all of a sudden, you know, you're like, where's my mountain map board? You know, like you change, metamorphosize and stuff. Um, I would definitely pick it up before then, because last time I checked the website, it was still at the $55 um, price tag as opposed to the $79. So... Just throwing that out there. But overall, this is a, a, a really good game. It's a clever game, and it's a fun game and tense. Very tense. So in the end, for me, the three factors that are most important to a game are tension, replayability, and fun. And this one has all three of those. It's highly replayable. Each one of my three games played out differently. The tension is ridiculous. I had to sweat each card that I was trying to figure out what to do. And then, fun, I had a blast all three times. And I can see myself having a blast in the future. This is going to be a permanent part of my collection. Um, you know, this will be the proverbial, you can have it when you pry it from my cold, dead hand kind of thing. So, that is my review of Europe in Turmoil, Prelude to the Great War. And again, as I mentioned before, next time I come with you for um, a replay video, it'll be from... Um, Blitz, which I have set up on the main event table. I'm sure you noticed from the background here, I've got the white table, table number four in the uh, man cave. But the main event will be, you know, is where the main event table is where Blitz, a world in conflict, is set up right now. So, that's my review. This is Tim Korchnoy from... Ah! There's my paper. From Bare Bones Wargaming, saying thanks for watching. And we will see you next time, jumping ahead from one war to another. Thanks for watching.